Today's Mother's Day, on top of it being the first day of the week, the day the church is commanded to come together to worship God in spirit and in truth. Last year I preached a sermon on Mother's Day, and I'm preaching one this year, and I'm moving the series on fellowship to this afternoon. I don't a lot of times preach specifically on Mother's Day or Father's Day, a sermon pertaining to the same. But maybe you'll see the method in my madness in view of the fact last Sunday afternoon we studied about the role of women and what God created a woman to be and her sphere of influence in life and her place of work. Well, there was a teacher I read about who was warning her students to be able to write a card to their mothers on Mother's Day. So she thought she would ask them some questions to kind of get ideas so they could write them one of these cards. And the first question she asked was, what are some ingredients? What are some ingredients mothers are made of? Well, Debbie, who's age five, answered it this way. God makes mothers out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world. And one dab of mean. <laughs> and then little Jeffrey at age six answered that question this way. They had to get their start from men's bones. Then they mostly used string and duct tape, I think. Well, she wasn't really getting the answer she wanted, so she asked this question. What kind of little girl was your mom? And one little girl says, my mom just always been my mom and none of the other stuff. <laughs> that was Luke at age six. And Sarah, age seven, said, I don't know because I wasn't there. My guess would be pretty bossy. Greg, age five, said, they say she used to be nice. Well, we all know what it's like. Ask children that age what's what and Art Lincoln letter of years ago made no telling how many hundreds and hundreds and millions of dollars probably over what is it ain't strange what children say and he would just simply have children of a certain age coming on his program and ask them questions like this and you get no telling what one thing you'll get just what they think they're not inhibited but my sermon this morning is having to do with Ingredients, You know, she said, what are some ingredients that mothers are made of? I'm talking about ingredients for making a mother. Ingredients for making a mother. One thing that is completely ignored, well, maybe not quite completely ignored, but almost, is that God never intended for there to be a mother unless she was first a wife. We need to understand that. That's God's order of things. For people who care about God and serving God, they're going to be mindful of that. And when you go back to the beginning of marriage in the home, the book of Genesis, then you can see in before the fall and after the fall, that is their sins, the state of affairs. Now I hope you'll keep in mind those that we here and heard last week God's arrangement of man and woman and relationship of woman to man, vice versa, because we're talking about a wife who is a mother. Now, I know, and you do too, that for many years there have been all sorts of single mother, mothers. Many of them never married. Many of them married and divorced for all sorts and sizes of reasons. Many of them not at all acceptable to the Bible. But whatever the case is, if things will be done decently in order for the family, God's first divine institution he put on this earth, then it'll be when people go back to the will of God and say, we're going to make our marriage and our home and the rearing of our children as God teaches. We'll do the best we can. Now, let me say at the very beginning, because each one of us are free moral agents, all the godly examples that I can set and the best of teaching I can do and instruction 
is not going to guarantee completely and totally that everybody is what they ought to be. If that was the case, then preaching the gospel to any crowd of people not Christians, they'd all obey the gospel every time it was preached. But that's not the case, is it? And if people can reject the truth of how to become a Christian, etc., then they will reject the truth of God concerning marriage and the home and the roles, men and women, and the fact that a woman ought to be a wife before she becomes a mother. Now, the Bible has many references to women who show, in part, maybe one of them all alone doesn't show completely all there is about a mother, but in part, they give us an overall view of the very nature of motherhood. You remember Moses' mother, Jochebed? Now you think about how much she cared for Moses. She broke Pharaoh's law <clears throat> to keep him safe. And that meant giving him up and raising him as you normally would. But she was a thinker, a planner. And she sent his older sister to see what would happen of uh, Moses in his little ark in the bulrushes. And that's when, of course, Pharaoh's daughter found him and took him. But then what was her instructions from the actual mother of Moses? Well, Miriam went up to Pharaoh's daughter and said, yeah, they recognized by his, what he was wrapped in, that he was one of the Hebrew children. She would have known the will of Pharaoh. And she told him, you know, I can find you a nurse. And what's very interesting, God's good providence, because if people were determined to abide by the will of God no matter what else, Moses came right back into the care of his mother in those very formative years. Thus we'll read of them when he reaches manhood that he knows who he is. And he knows the God of heaven. And he doesn't understand exactly how it's going to work out for him, but he knows he is to leave his princely position. Possibly would have even become Pharaoh. He was in that line. And as the writer of Hebrews says, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Where did he learn to think like that? I suggest to you, it was because his mother laid that foundation. I wish we had more wise mothers like Jacobed who could figure out a way to save her child and then figure out a plan so she could nurse him. Exodus 2, 1 through 3 and verse 9. There's the picture of the mother who appeared before King Solomon. <clears throat> You'll all remember this. And she loved her child so much that she was willing to give him up forever rather than see any harm come to him at all. 1 Kings 3, 16 through 27. People want to understand what does it mean for a mother to love her child. Well, if you just stop with those two examples, it would go a long, long way toward women understanding as wives what it is to be a godly mother. Now, even though... James and John's mother was misinformed about the nature of the kingdom of Christ. Notice how she still had in her error the desire for the best for her sons, James and John. She loved them so much she wanted them to have places of rule right next to Christ, one on the right hand and one on the left in the kingdom. Matthew twenty twenty one. Well, of course, Christ straightened them out on that, but do you see the desire of the mother? And I think that sets out when you take those three, one from the New Testament, two from the Old, exactly how a mother ought to think when it comes to, first of all, being a wife, and all the Bible says a woman is in her role, and then when she becomes a wife, the duties of a wife, the privileges of a wife, and then when she becomes a mother. So the picture the totality of these things gives us a singular picture of mothers that are not always flawless. You won't find them. 
but it's a very practical picture because we can learn very valuable lessons from their example. And fathers, as the head of the house, the husband is, who's charged by God to see the children are brought up in the nurture and eminence of the Lord, can have a hand with those children having the proper understanding of their mother and her responsibilities and her dedication and her sacrifice for their own good. Now we're talking about the power of her influence. What is influence? It is the power I have over others for good or bad according to the kind of life I'm living. The power of example. When you read Hebrews 11, that great Hall of Fame chapter on faithful people, really you're seeing word pictures of the example of people in service to God. By faith they did thus and so. By faith they did thus and so. And of course we know by faith they did thus and so it was an obedient faith. Thus in the home, a home as God would have it, and that's going to be as the Bible directs, the teaching and the training, the example and the influence for good ought to be there. I don't, well, well let's say it this way. While there are many roles that people might be in that are important in life, None of them are as important as the role of mother. That's why, and I don't know when it was written, but it was a long, long time ago, but they sure got it right. Nobody's improved on it unless they need to go look up today what a cradle is. But the saying is, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That's just simply saying the powerful influence by example and other ways that a mother has over her children. I want to mention this at this point. I remember well when our children were all the stair steps and little. That there was this elderly man, preacher, who was probably at that time the age I am now, maybe older. And he made this point. He says, David, you right now are mindful of being a husband and father, and particularly a father, as you labor to preach. He said, but I want you to remember one thing. This is just a phase of your life, and right now it seems like it engulfs all that you can think, say, and do. But believe it or not, this time will pass. It'll pass faster than you can ever think it would, and you'll still have, if you live a normal life, a long time in which that concern won't be there with you as it is now. And that's so true. That is so true. I recognize that as wisdom coming from somebody who'd been through what I hadn't been through. But you know as well as I do when children are little and the smaller they are, the more demanding it is to be able to be with them and take care of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of us know that. And it may seem it's never going to end. I remember going with the kids and I never knew what I had smeared on my lapel or if I was carrying one of them, they used this for some sort of swing. You know, when you dress, you look at Jody and say, what have I got on me? And, and that kind of thing goes and it seems like, you know, it's all day long every day. It just goes on and on and on. And it's even more so than a course for the mother just because of what the Bible says a mother is and her duties are. And for the loving mother who wants to be all she can be in her role, then it just seems like it'll go on. But I'm telling you, please listen to me. Those days will pass, and they will pass faster than you can believe. And there'll be memories before you know it. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I think any of the wise men, if you can truly call them wise men, have always realized the very big part that women played in their lives. 
It's sad that some men do not respect good and godly women as they should. But I know where that can be remedied. That's in the home. Oh, but what about the pulpit? Well, you're hearing some of that now, but primarily the home. What about the classrooms where the Bible's taught? Yes, that can be good. But both of those, from the pulpit and in the classroom, are supplemental to what goes on 24 hours a day in the home and that mother is charged to be a part of. I think it's interesting that one of the great statements that's made is made to a young preacher as to what he needed to know, but what he needed to preach to the brethren. And think of those brethren of the first century Roman Empire and the kind of lives they lived. And yet when you come over to Titus chapter 2 and verse number 3 beginning, we'll read through verse 5. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness. Now is that example? Is that wielding an influence? Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That covers a myriad of things. All those are general statements. Then it gets a little more specific. That they, who, these aged women, and, and I might keep in mind, some of us think of aged women as somebody barely ever get along. Back in those days, a woman might be considered aged who's 40 years old. That they may teach the young women to be sober. <clears throat> Let me ask you something. Do you think that needs to be taught today? To have a mind that sees things as they are, that views things in the light of God's right and divided word, that understands what we studied about last Sunday afternoon as to the role God has given the woman, the wife, and the mother, to love their husbands. That's interesting. Here the Holy Spirit's telling young preachers a part of preaching to the church to make them strong Christians, the older women ought to teach younger women how to love their husbands. What? They don't know? I can tell you right now there's a host of women in this society that don't know. Now, what used to happen when the extended family was closer together 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago, then they were all together, many people never getting further than 25 to 50 miles away from home their whole life. And they lived in a little community where there was aunts and uncles and grandpa and grandma and cousins and brothers and sisters and everybody there, and families a lot larger, so you had a lot of older brothers and sisters almost raising the younger ones then you had that kind of close involvement in which things were observed and they were good families and families were closer to what the bible said in general and the laws of the land helped them more those times and they learned a lot of these things in general but this means You need to be instructed in how to love your husband. Now, I will admit that if they are Christian husbands, devoted to God, seeking first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, uh, that would be a lot easier thing to do. But you've got to remember, in converting these people at that time, they many times were anything but that. But that didn't mean love your husbands if they're faithful Christians. <clears throat> he didn't say that. He said, love your husbands. But notice they had to be taught also to love their children. There is, in a normal person, the natural sense of caring for your own. But the Bible's full of material that talks about people not having that natural attitude, rebelling against it, going against it. One of the reasons that homosexuality is so wicked is not because it's just a sin. It's going against nature. Read Romans 1. And some women go against nature. What's natural? The way God made them. Thus the need for that sermon last week for all of us. And if you're going to see your children grow up to be what God wants them to be in view of what's going on, the transgender business, homosexuality, Homes breaking up for every reason under the sun or living together, no intention of marrying of any kind. You're going to have to teach that. You're going to have to train them in your home. 
that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their children, to love, to love their husbands, to love their children. Now notice, these are women who've already been doing this right. These are women like the elderly preacher I told you about who had already gone that, who was giving me some good advice. And I've cherished it. But then he doesn't stop there. There's some more teaching the older faithful women ought to be doing through their experience and knowledge of the Bible. And notice they can't really do this unless they know the Bible. Because you can't teach what you don't know. To be discreet. Chaste, C-H-A-S-T-E. There's too many other kind of chaste. Keepers at home. Ooh. That is almost a curse word today. Keepers at home. Obedient to their own husbands. Now, nah, that's even worse. And there's a reason. We referred to this last week. That the word of God be not blasphemed. In other words, you're a new creature in Christ. You're a different person for all this bunch you used to run around with. You think differently from what they think. You don't have the same appetites for things as they do. You're putting to death the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. They're cultivating it. Now, these older women who are Christians, they've been through this. They've made those decisions. They've suffered some trial and error, and they need to be dealing with these younger women. You can't remove this from your Bible. You can run off from it. You can close your ears to it. And I'll refer you back to Jonathan's sermon on the devotional. And just tie it into what I tried to preach last Sunday afternoon. Well, if you're upset at that sermon, then you're upset at the Word of God. And if you're going to be upset at that part of the Word of God, you might as well be upset with the rest of it. Because you break one part of the law, the whole body of law condemns you. So James wrote, Brethren, do you really, can you really think of anything else more important than these few words and the charge laid upon the older women to do the kind of teaching and where it ought to be done. Now notice he's not talking about the successful woman as the woman of the world are considered success, successes in business. Have you noticed how much the news points out lately where well, here's a woman that's a CEO and there's not many of them. Here's a woman that's this and that. Uh, that doesn't measure up what's said here. What should be the chief interest of a woman who is a wife and a mother? It should be to take care of her home. Now, I'd be the last one to say, especially this day and age with the home and the mess that it is and the society the way that it is, to say that it wouldn't be wise for a woman to have some sort of training, some sort of teaching, something that if she has to take care of herself and her family without a husband, she can do it. But still the center and focus, according to the Bible, is her being a wife and mother where all things are being done as they ought to. Look at First uh, Peter chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation, that is, the life, the conduct of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation, manner of life, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be, and let has, the, let has the force of a command. Let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which, in the sight, which is in the sight of God of great price. Well, I would like to do those things in my own life as a man, those things that are of great price to God, and why wouldn't a woman want to do the same thing? When you get up in the morning, what are you thinking about? What you're going to wear? But the greatest thing outwardly wear is to be thinking about the inward adornment of the inward man, the person. The inner self. The unfading 
beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Without inner beauty, any outward beauty is, well, to use the words of Proverbs 11.22, as a ring of gold and a swine snout. Beauty comes from the inside out. And too many young people think they're nothing because they have never been taught their true beauty is their inward beauty. I'm convinced that many of the troubled teenagers of today are so tied up with the way the world measures success and beauty and who's handsome and who is in the in crowd and all that, that it troubles them to a great extent because they're not accepted. But if they would have the reinforcement of a godly mother at home, training and teaching and setting an example and teaching the Bible to them, it'd make a difference how they viewed themselves. And it makes a big difference on all of us, how we view ourselves. And the Bible's the only thing that can give us a proper perspective of ourselves. If I won't try to read it now, but if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2, and through 5, we've already noticed that last week, that it was the grandmother and mother of Timothy who made him to a great extent what he was. Nothing said of the father too bad it could have been said that he was there doing what God said and guiding the home and seeing that these things were done, but nothing's mentioned of him. We don't know whether he's anywhere around. Maybe this is all he had was a grandmother and mother. But nevertheless, they instructed him in the Bible. That meant they were good Bible students. They were experienced in putting to practice the truth. And when Paul saw Timothy, he saw a man of great potential. He saw a person strong in doctrine strong in faith, one who could stand up for God and proclaim the gospel, one who was fearless. He had the power of love, and the Bible says a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7. All that began with Grandma and Mama. If that doesn't begin to show us the importance of a mother, I don't know what it does, besides all the rest we've looked at. I don't know what memories children will take with them or their mother and grandmother but I know what the Bible's teaching here and you know what Timothy's memories would have been of his mother and grandmother Paul could recognize it and he could too what a duty and yet what a privilege motherhood is the story's told at least I read about it of a large family of children who was remarkably successful as far as the mother is concerned, the mother of those children was remarkably successful in her training and teaching. Somebody asked her her secret, and here's what she said. When my children were young, I thought the very best thing I could do for them was to give them myself. So I spared no pains to talk with them, to teach them, and be a loving mother to my children. I had to neglect my house many times, I had no time to indulge myself in many things which I should have liked to do. I was so busy adorning their minds and cultivating their hearts, best affections, that I could not adorn their, that I could not adorn their body, bodies in fine clothes, though I kept them neat, clean, and comfortable at all times. That probably could be said to mothers many, many years ago, the average person in the United States can today because many times just right the opposite. They get everything they want. They don't need anything. And we see that every time. Here comes time to give them gifts. What do you give them? They already have everything. But I guarantee you most of them don't have what this woman said. The reward that you'll get is the fact you know you did what you were supposed to as a wife and mother. They may never reach 25. They all may be dead. But you will know that you fulfilled your role as a woman and a wife and a mother and did your part. That is a comforting thought. It's one that we should not overlook. Now, in closing, very hurriedly, I want you to turn to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. This uh, is where 
King Lemuel, Lemuel wrote this, and he's portraying the beauty of a good woman. I don't see how you can separate this from a good wife and a good mother. Verse 11, I'll just go over it this way. Verse 11 of Proverbs 31, she is trustworthy. Verse 17, she's strong in her convictions. Verses 19 and 20, she's soft and merciful, caring for the less fortunate and demonstrating compassion. Verse 21, she's optimistic. Verses 22 and 25, she's strong and dignified. Verses 13 through 16 and verses 24 and 27, she's industrious. Verses 28 through 31, notice, for all these things and more, she had the unending praise of her family. Is it hard to be a good mother? If you give yourself to anything according to God's will, it's going to take a great deal of effort. When Paul said that he buffeted his body and brought it in subjection, lest ever after having preached to others he was a castaway, then you must realize our duty is to shape our minds and thus our lives in the likeness of Christ. And so the mother, to be a good mother, as the Bible defines such, is a labor of love. It's more than cooking and cleaning. It is the privilege of caring for her family and even others. And you know the Bible teaches us the joy in serving others. Motherhood is not some second-rate choice of a woman. And that must be taught, mamas and daddies, to your girls and to your boys. It's patterned like the Lord who came not to be served but to serve, Matthew 20 and 28. And as with Christian living, it's about serving and finding privilege and happiness in doing it. So as we close the lesson, high praise to all of those mothers who rate the appellation faithful, godly mothers. And to the men who are married to those faithful, godly mothers, you better think seriously about the ingredients that make that kind of mother. And fall on your face before God quite often, thanking God for her in the midst of this perverse and wicked generation. It plays down virtually everything I said last Sunday afternoon and this morning concerning marriage in the home and the wife and the mother. God bless all the mothers who love the truth. God bless all the fathers who have sense enough to recognize what they got. If you're not a child of God this morning, we beg of you to obey the gospel by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in the Christ, and being baptized to Christ for the remission of sins. If as a child of God you have sinned, you need to repent of them. If they're private sins known only to you and God, take care of them there by repenting and confessing them to God you committed sins, you don't know how the influence, bad it would be, has gone. And you need to take care of it publicly and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And we'll pray with you in four years, your brothers and sisters in Christ, who love you. And that's a wonderful thing about the fellowship of members of the church. Sometimes we don't realize. I've got somebody that loves me and will pray for me in all my weaknesses and mistakes. So if you're subject to the call of Jesus our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.